All right, welcome to Nordic Magic Link. Today I have Carla with me from Ancestral River and uh, she is a biofield tuner, which is uh, a type of sound healing. And uh, we're gonna learn more about that today. Welcome, Carla. Well, thanks, Emma, good to be here. I'm glad you could come and you wanted to, to uh, tell my audience more about what it is that you do. Um, just uh, to start off, I would love to just hear about um, what it is you do and how you got started with it. Okay. Um, well, the technical part of it is uh, biofield tuning. It was um, developed by Eileen McCusick um, at biofieldtuning.com. I personally am not a certified biofield tuner, so I don't call myself a biofield tuner, but I do um, work in people's biofield using tuning forks, and I have received training through Eileen as well as some other sources, and I use tuning forks. Here's a, a one weighted fork that's often used, and then here's there's various sizes of unweighted forks, and I work in people's biofield, which um, it's been... Um, proven basically through Eileen and many other people's work that um, humans have a biofield or some people call it an aura around our bodies of light waves of plasma so to speak because there's more than um, solid liquids and gases it starts with ether it starts with light particles and then it's a little bit more dense and you have plasma and then you have gas and then you have liquid and then you have solids and all the others start with ether and then are just more compressed into that. So anyway, our biofields are thought to be plasma as far as the denseness of it and it's light waves that radiate from our bodies and all the light waves are carrying light particles and when we are breathing um, from our diaphragm, from low in our lungs, and we're calm and we're focused in the present, then we're in flow. Our light waves are, are flowing. Like you would see pictures of light waves, just generally all of them nicely shaped. When we come out of that, like so often now we live in a chronic low grade state of fight or flight or freeze all the time, then we're breathing from our upper lungs and it takes us out of flow and the light waves in those sections are choppy or maybe they're flatlined, right? And so those little pockets or uh, sections of the stuck energy, so to speak, the stuck energy particles um, are flow, the light waves are still flowing, but it has chunks of these pockets in it, right? And so that's on light waves. Um, sound waves are part of the light wave spectrum. And so the sound waves from the tuning forks intersect the pockets, or they intersect the light waves. And when the light waves are flowing and the sound waves are flowing and all is good, then the, the, you hear the nice sound from the forks or the, the, the good vibration or resonance from the forks. But when the sound waves encounter a pocket of stuck energy, then it becomes dissonant. The sound is dissonant. There is tension in the air, um, things like that, that that are from the body having had those um, situations or experiences that cause you to freeze or get scared or or um, worry and um, so then the um, sound acts as biofeedback to the body and it hears itself basically and adjusts and so then those um, stuck particles get released and then the sound waves also have um, magnetic properties and so then the magnetism of the forks then draw the, the released particles with it and you take it from where the particle isn't doing any good and put them into your central channel through your energy centers or your chakras and um, put it back into your body so you can use them again. Wow. 
So, and do uh, we know how this was found out? Um, you mentioned uh, studies. Um, well, I'm most familiar with Eileen's work, Eileen McCusick's work, biofieldtuning.com, and she had started as a massage therapist, is my understanding, and um, she has a very interesting book out that's, if anyone wanted to read it, it's um, Tuning the Human Biofield, I believe is the name of it, but it's very interesting, and she was just using um, tuning forks um, as part of her massage practice, and people reported it made it, her, it feel better. They were placed on their bodies, and mm -hmm. one time, um, it was kind of like by accident, she had um, struck the fork and got it sounding when she, before she got to the person's body, and it made different sounds that were not the nice sounds, it was dissonant sounds, and so that started her many, many years, um, 20 years or more plus of, um, of studying and mapping out the, where emotions are stored in the human biofield. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, uh, it's awesome. She, she did amazing work and the, the electric universe is just amazing because, um, the biofield is very much part of that because we all have one. And actually, because everything starts with ether and then becomes more and more dense to solid, we are, we exist as spirit and in our biofield before we exist in our body. And so if you have emotional distress in your biofield, the tuning fork will then pick it up and you can hear it in the sound. Is that how it is? Yeah, like, um, let's see. I'll just give an example here. Um, the non-weighted forks are often struck on a hockey puck just because it's a, a nice solid surface. And so if the energy is nice, this is a good sound from it. It sounds nice. Um, sometimes if I'm working a person's biofield and they're, it's a say fear or worry or something, it might be a real low vibration or a real low resonance. It might be a, a, a low pitch sound. Um, it might be a real um, tinny sound or a higher pitch sound or just sound real muffled. Or maybe the tone is bright and clear, but the resonance isn't there. It's just kind of uh, not full. Mm. And so every emotion has its own, is its own frequency. Each is an energy. And so the bio, the tuning forks then, um, the sound that is emitted is a different um, noise or a different type of resonance for each, um, each emotion that it's encountered. And then when you strike the tuning fork several times, then it changes the sound with the with the biofield of the human that you are working with. Yeah, usually it takes um, more than one strike at the fork to have that stuck pocket release. Um, it depends on you know how dense the pocket was. Maybe if you were only in that um, fight or flight for a short amount of time, or maybe it was. Um, not a real um, serious type uh, thing that was life or death or, or that you, you know, you weren't, t you were a little sad, but not incredibly sad and grieving, right? So there's all sorts of um, things that might affect how big the pocket of stuck energy is or how dense it is, the energy is in it. And so I just, when you find the pocket, you just continue striking the fork. And then if it doesn't clear right away, then, well, you can use different forks. And different frequencies respond to, or I should say different of the stuck energies then respond to the frequencies of different forks in different ways. So sometimes one um, clears the stuck energy better than another one does. The, the ones that I like most are, these are the weighted forks. Um, these are Fibonacci 
um, sequence they're in. And I have um, Eileen um, McCusick had developed these um, circuit boots. And they're very effective. Um, they kind of amplify the energy or the sound waves that are coming off the forks. And sometimes um, people might use them in addition to, say, crystals of various kinds. Um, that again, it's different frequencies that are emitted or emitted from the the forks or from the crystals and the then the particles the sec particles respond differently mm. and so you find what works best and i think it varies too with the practitioner who's using it because our biofields are right there too where you're working and so um i might find things that another practitioner um, that doesn't appear that day, you know, if you, if we were doing the same person, um, <laughs> one right after the other, or if you could um, seem to do the same person at the same time separately, <laughs> then it's like uh, not all the same st um, stuck energies or emotions would appear for one practitioner as the other, because the practitioner's um, frequencies are are different than each other. And so it's going to pick up different things. Is the biofield the same as an aura? Um, I think in general it is. Um, I haven't like studied Eastern teachings. Um, so there might be some um, nuances or some um, teachings and things about an aura that make it uh, different um but very much it's the light the circle or the um the word is escaping me toroid shape um sphere around our bodies and it extends um, about five to six feet around our bodies um, as a radius, like so five five to six feet around in every direction except top and bottom. And then it's um, the top of, we have a central channel where the energy flows through that um, it's easily described, I guess, as you could sense it as running parallel to your spine, right, basically. And so, um, where the energy centers are, our chakras. And the, the sun star or the top of your um, central channel on a person would be about a foot above your head. And the earth star is about a foot above below your feet. And then I call it like the shoulders of the toroid field then extend above where the earth star is and below, I should say, below where the earth star is and above where the sun star is to make the toroid shape. Or some people describe it perhaps as a donut shape because you have, again, the shoulders type thing and it's wider around than it is taller. Hmm. And um, the human biofield, um, it's chronological. It contains your whole life experiences. Um, of all your emotions through and your experiences throughout your life. And so the outer membrane of the biofield of that five or six foot from around your body contains, the outer edge of it contains what was happening in your parents' lives when you were conceived. And then there's conception, gestation, and birth. And then from there, it's year by year, chronological, until it gets to your body. So it's like an energy field uh, of your ancestors as layers around you. Uh, well, the first biofield is your own life, mm -hmm. except for um, running down either side of your body, about 10 inches from either side of your body are streams of energy that do contain energy of your ancestors, your father's families on the right hand side, your mother's families on the left hand side in those rivers. And those have been termed ancestral rivers because they're streams of DNA energy, right? Flowing down your body. Hence and the name of your website. Hence the name of my website. Yeah. 
it wasn't taken yet. <laughs> and so I thought, well, that's perfect, right? And so, but we have more than one biofield. Um, the first one contains our life experiences. The second biofield has been um, found to extend up to 30 feet away from your body. I routinely work at 25 to 30 feet from my body. I work out as far as the um, inside of my house allows me to. And then I just consciously kind of shrink the energy so that I use the intention that, okay, the outer membrane is right here, the farthest out I can get in my house. And then the rest of it, um, the whole biofield then of the outer of the second biofield is found then within that 26 to 27 feet. But um, the second biofield contains the life experiences and stuck um, emotions of each of our ancestors, our direct ancestors, our parents, our grandparents, great grandparents, and so on. Wow. So it's, it's very, very interesting. Yeah. And you're able to sense these uh, energies when you work with people? Uh, yes. Um, that part kind of found me. Um, I didn't expect to work with ancestors. I, I expected just to work within the first biofield of people. And I started working and, and things started um, happening. I was always being called out like not audibly sound but it was like I don't know I guess you would call it intuition or it would be like a knowing it was like I was being shown really is what it is I'm being shown and I, I it's not like I see something visually but I see where it is <laughs> and it's like you need to start here and so so, yes, and then the ancestors of the relatives, parents and grandparents that have died um, often appear in the, the work that I do. It, it seems as if there is a majority of people that do not fully transition to where they need to be in the afterlife or where they're choosing to be in the afterlife it's like um they don't know what choice to make perhaps until they have died and then um then they have to wait for a relative to to assist them with that at least that's what uh, appears to me it's uh a lot of times it it seems like it might be sometimes it's some of their stuck emotions, maybe uh, a, a very strong emotion that has kept them from making that decision. Sometimes it might be an attachment to, to a living person or from an ad attachment extended from the living person. Other times it very much seems to be that they had a lack of knowledge of what the afterlife was like. And so there was no way they could make an honest or, you know, heartfelt, um, integrative decision until they knew the truth about what it was like. And then, then they can, once they've been there, then they find out. Another reason that I've found that they don't transition right away is because um, they want an acknowledgement that their life was worthwhile or they were appreciated. Hmm. Um, one ancestor had told me, I just wanted to know someone cared. And so, um, again, I, uh, they do speak to me and um, I don't see them. I see where their energy is at. And uh, I don't audibly hear it. But I hear what they say in sentences. 
usually. Sometimes it's it's not quite that. Mm. Sometimes it's more of a, a, a feeling. But usually it's it's words or expressions. Mm. Yeah. And um, no, I, I didn't plan on this at all. It um, it found me. And um, after I'd done it for a while, I found out why it found me. And that is because I have found that um, my house is built on two ley lines, dragon lines, energy lines, whatever you call it. There's, since then, I've taken a home study course on dowsing, and I'm, and I'm, I'm learning dowsing, too. But it's, there's many types of energy that run through the earth and through the, the air, through the energy, right, through the ether. And each has their own type of separate um, logistics or separate set of um, rules, perhaps, if you want to use the word rules, that, that they abide by or when they occur. And the ley lines, um, when they intersect or where they interchange they don't like intersect and run into each other and bash they like flow around each other so I call it an interchange basically and where they interchange at 90 degree angles it creates a portal in the afterlife where they transition to the other side or to wherever they're going right and where two ley lines intersect but do not have 90 degree angles. So anything other than a 90 degree angle, it creates a negative vortex where that attracts um, spirit beings who have not transitioned. So um, sometimes that might be, um, you know, Homes or cemeteries or churches are often built on um, ley lines or vortexes of different kinds, either positive or negative. I assume positive, but I don't know. You know, I haven't um, tested them and stuff to know. But so anyway, but I had felt this energy run through my house. I knew something was there because on the solstice, I had gone out and I had decided, well, I was just going to tune the nearest ley line without knowing where it was. But I just thought that sounded like a cool thing to do on the solstice, right? And so um, I just held the intention because our our thoughts are light waves. Our thoughts are transport in the light waves from our bodies, right, throughout the ether in our electric universe. And so... I just held the intention as I began tuning that um, I would tune the near sleigh line. And it's common that they're found in river valleys or on mountain ridges or things like that. And I live in a river valley. So I figured, well, you know, the river's not too many miles away. You know, I bet there's a ley line within two or three miles. And so, so anyway, I struck the fork with the intention of tuning the ley line and whoosh. It was like there wasn't a wind blowing, but it was like I heard this whoosh go by within three feet of me, right? And it went through my house. And so that was my experience. I thought, wow, <laughs> that was, you know, it was just interesting. I still, and I still thought, well, maybe I was seeing it. Maybe, maybe it's just because I held that intention. Maybe I was just feeling the energy from wherever it was flowing a mile or two away or wherever it was. And so I didn't think a whole lot of it. But then um, I was visiting with someone who's an energy worker and they were talking about um, ley lines and they suggested that I ground um, they said your your throat shock, your throat doesn't have a full resonance to it that when you talk they said I think you should ground your your voice to the ley line and I thought well I'd never heard of doing something like that and I thought 
So I thought, I bet that's what that is. I meant that I felt, I bet that ley line does run through my house. I'm going to try it. And so I could feel the energy as it runs through the house. And so I sat on, I live in a, in a 120 year old house, right? It's an old farmhouse type of thing, wooden floors. So I sat on the floor so energy could transport up easily because there's no there's no basement under it. It just the energy would just come up. And I sat down there and I held the intention of grounding to the ley line. And it was the it was an incredible experience. I just um, I had no idea. And so then it wasn't like a week later um, and it wasn't by chance. I know because things happen in the electric universe that aren't just by chance. And so I, all my email coming in one day, I looked at it and there was a free dowsing seminar, right? By Marie Diamond. And so I listened to it very intently to the whole thing. And I thought that has to be what's here. And with the ancestral work I do, I bet there's a positive vortex in my house because the ancestors are transitioning here, right? In my work on a 90% of the sessions, biofield sessions, I do 90% probably have ancestors that appear that want to transition. And so I did not have dousing rods. I have dousing rods now and I had some laying right here. Here's my dousing rods. And, um, Anyway, and um, but anyways, but in biofield tuning, um, we use a pendulum and it's not as woo woo, but it shows which chakra. It's a way of the the electric universe of, in the, your biofields informing you where the work needs to be done. Right. And so. Um, now I lost my train of thought. I took my pendulum. I didn't have dousing rods. And so I took my pendulum and walked around the outside of my house. Right. And so I found it exactly where I heard that energy go on the solstice. Right. It was whoosh, and it's four or five feet wide right there. And they say when you have two that interchange, um, one is small and one is large. Right. So I thought, well, I just started walking around the house. And so I was almost out of house and I'd kind of given up. I thought, you know, OK. And then all of a sudden, I wasn't even really paying attention. And then all of a sudden, the pendulum started going like crazy. It was the second ley line. So then I came in the house and mapped out exactly the edges of the ley lines from um, from both of them and found where they exactly intersect. And it's in the room that I work. Wow. Yeah, and then not too long ago then, I was, um, uh, again, it was through the dousing um, um, course that I was reading through again. And it was talking about you can enhance the um, positive vortexes by, um, a quartz crystal of some kind. And the only kind I had that was fairly large was um, we had gone to um, visit a relative in Denver and we were out in one of the parks and just, I was like 20 feet or 30 feet from the little pond in the park or whatever. And I just moved my foot and there was this quartz, right? Right in there. So I looked around and no one was watching. So I <laughs> stuck it in my purse. Right? That was yours. That was mine. Yeah. And so I put that there and it turned the energy in the room because the um, dousing rods, you can you can ask them um, um, and it'll turn um, and show you the strength of the energy in any given room mm -hmm. or any home or a yard or whatever. And, and how so, does it show how does it show what the strength is? Well, like um, um let's see. Let's see if I can do that. You you have to have the right um set. I might be too nervous from being on the podcast to get a correct. 
So it's like, um, what is the what is the energy level of this room? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And for those listening, the dowsing rod is moving around. Yeah, uh, it was spinning, spinning yeah. around and around. Now, I don't think it was a, a real accurate reading because I'm nervous. Oh. But um, I, I wasn't turning it purposefully. It was spinning. It yeah. spins. Um, They're very if sensitive. A, yeah. If it's a negative energy, it spins counterclockwise. If it's... Um, positive energy it spins clockwise and so anyway so I had gone into the room where I work and I had asked um, for the universe to show me what the what energy level it was and and it was good because I'd cared for some other lines energy lines that ran through there that were negative because there's a lot of positive energy lines in the earth that when they come into your home because of the electricity that runs around the outer edge of our houses, then it turns the negative in, it turns the positive energy negative within your house and it bounces back and forth between your walls of the electricity that runs through your walls, right? So I had cured several lines that ran through there. So I knew that room was positive energy. And so it maybe did to, um, I can't remember for sure, like a positive eight or something like that. I put that that piece of quartz rock right on my interchange, the X that I have. Um, I'm using painter's tape on the floor, the, the blue painter's tape. And so I put the quartz right on the X and um, it went up to positive 18. So it went from 8 to 18, just being the quartz. So, yeah, very much so different things will enhance the different energies. Wow. Um but uh, that's yeah, uh, kind it's of interesting. Um, interesting. You know, the work with with ley lines and ancestors is something that uh, we've also uh, seen in all shamanic cultures and all shamanic traditions. And uh, as I always say on this podcast, we've we've had shamanic traditions in all cultures all over the world at some point because it basically is the the you know, living close with nature and observing nature um, and working with the energies of nature. Um, so it's interesting that um, that you found that out about the ley lines. And, you know, and we've also seen that with 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 uh, Native Americans and they've they had their certain areas that were also on ley lines and they would do specific rituals on these in these areas or they would bury people there or you know, things of, of that sort. Well, and what, what I have found, um, I don't have anything that tangible that proves this, but from what I found of the ley line, the, the energy in the ley line is, well, just like every emotion has its own energy or its own frequency, every energy outdoors would have its own frequency. But the energy of the ley line differs from the energy of the just of the earth or the energy of the trees. Like every tree has its own type of energy. My spirea bushes have its own energy, right? And the plantain, the little uh, grass plants on the ground, they have their own energy, right? And so um, the, the energy of the ley lines is the energy of source. It's the same frequency I feel when I connect to source in the in the ether, right? Mm -hmm. It's they they are the same energy as what it feels to me. And what is the ether and what is the uh, electric universe? Um well I I am no expert by any means and I don't know all the the correct technical jargon to use. But I do know I love it and I love learning about it. Um, ether has been a, a simple explanation. It's been called 
the luminous body of light through which light waves flow. So basically it's light, light particles, right? And um, there is some, um, I'm not sure who did it or, or what of um, studies of some kind, but it is indicated that our spirits, our beings, you know, of who we are that's not a physical body, right, is the space between the particles of light in the ether, right? That that's how, that's source, that's spirit, that's us um, all as the oneness, right? And um, so anyway, that's, that's the description of ether that I like. It, it's very simple. It's, it's broad enough, but yet it's conceptual enough. I mean, we can picture sunlight, right? And as sun streams in a window, you can see little particles in it, right? So it's, it's easy to, um, of course, those are probably dust in my house. <laughs> but um, but it, it's easy to conceptualize um, that explanation of it, I think. And so because the ether, because light is made of charged particles and that are attracted or, or um, what do you call it, you know, uh, pushed away from each other, then that's electricity. That's what electricity is based on. So that's the electric universe. And um, it's just kind of what we talked about before. Everything is originated with ether, with source, with the, the particles and the space between them. And it's all become to get to solids, even, you know, your car or your house or, or whatever is all just condensed either that's condensed in various ways to various degrees. And because it's electric, then it, everything communicates electrically through light waves, um, which is our intentions. Our, our feelings, not so much the words, but the, the feelings and our desire, mm. spoken or unspoken. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. Um, and I've seen it uh, manifest in my life many times. Yeah. yeah. So And so this is how you can... You can uh, work with people both in person, but also um, at a distant distance, right? Uh, yes, yes, because it's by intention. And it's like I use a, um, a vinyl poster, so to speak, um, that has a generic human body on it with chakra points lined up. And it's I, you don't need one of those, um, but it just helps me feel like I'm being more accurate in my work, right? And so, um, but but it's by intention. And it's like the electric universe holds a, a record of everybody's life, everybody who's ever lived. It's like um, um, the Akashic record, you know, it's uh, perhaps that's the same thing, the book of life from other scripture, um, things like that, but because we're all of the oneness, made from the oneness, and our biofields exist in the oneness, it has the record, and it's like, I hold the intention, you know, Emma, if I was doing you, I'd say I'm working on, on Emma Cairo, right, and your hologram is there, and I would find everything of your life there. That, yeah. was re that was ready to be shown that day, that was ready to release that day, yeah. Every yeah. session is like a snapshot in time. It's, it's what's ready, what you're ready, you know, your subconscious or, 
or your spirit your, is ready to release that day. Yeah, and I have had sessions with you uh, over Zoom, and um, and I felt, you know, and um, my my father who has passed came up, and uh, I felt some release um, over the work that you were doing with him in my bio field. <laughs> so I can highly recommend it. Well, and I think that's the neat thing, um, because in in working with the ancestors, I, I like it especially because I can help, what is it, the old phrase, killing two birds with one stone. <laughs> it's, of course, I, we're not killing here. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's um, helping two people at the same time, right? Because in your or anybody's willingness to release that energy, to release that that ancestor, you're helping the ancestor to do what, to feel better and to go because he's still stuck, right? Or she or whatever. And in them releasing their energy, we're helped. And so it, it helps it helps two people at the same time. Or sometimes, um, um, usually if it's with parents or grandparents, there's just one person at a time because it's a, a very more of a closer relationship and it just takes more time. It seems like in more of your biofield, the closer the relative, the more presence they are in your biofield. Like, and but um um, when it gets to more extended um, relatives, like um, I have found grandparents back to the fourth generation. So like my grandparents, grandparents or whoever. So a great, great grandparent. And um, when it gets beyond there, I think that the fraction of the amount of them in your DNA or in your biofield is much, much less because like you have one on each side of your body, you would have like your dad's side on your right, you'd have one father, or in some cases you'd have a stepfather and a father and they both could be there. Right. And um, then you'd have two grandparents and then you'd have four great grandparents and then you'd have eight great, great grandparents. And then there can be Others in there, like I said, if there was a step parent or a step grandparent, or if there was an older sibling or an aunt or uncle that um, assumed or took the role of a mother or father um, mentor or that role in the person in one of the person's lives, their energies might very well be there too. And I have found those. Um, um, but it gets beyond the great, great grandparent. And I think the fraction of them in your biofield is small enough that it doesn't take up a lot of energy. Plus all of those extended ones, then all of their DNA, all of their stuck energy can be found in the biofields of the others that are there, right? Of your closer relatives. And so the extended ones beyond the third or fourth generation, um, I have had um, uh, quite a bit of experience and good results of, le of releasing those to transition just by intention, by um, inviting them or welcoming them and with the intention that they only come if they're ready to transition and um, they come and they go. But when yeah. you say that they might be stuck, that doesn't mean that they're ghosts, right? It just means that there's some energy in the field that's stuck. Or can you clarify? Yeah, I I do not know. I have not seen ghosts. Uh, so I do not know. Um, I I don't call them ghosts. I don't call them dead. I To me, it's just, I have come to view it as they're very much alive because they communicate with me, you know, and you're involved in their emotions. So it's like, you just can't see their physical bodies. But um, 
it's as if they have a body like it it seems like some it it seems to me that they have a body that they're taller like they have legs or that they they don't walk of course but they move i get the feel that they're moving as if they had a body um whereas um ones that have transitioned um it's more of a a oneness like it's just spirit being not not an aspect of a body with it so if they have transcended they're not um, they don't have their personality anymore it's more like they just become one with everything i think they still have their personality i think they very much exist as individuals they're just um only act as a a one because because they would have the same desire the same intention of being one with source of being one in the universe yeah i i think there's also a dark side that people can go to if they choose um the ones that for some reason do not want to be part with source there there is a seems to be that choice for people if they want and uh, maybe there is advantages of some kind or they think there is advantages of some kind there that or maybe it's what they're familiar with i i do not i do not know for Mm -hmm. sure i mean there's so much i i learn all the time um but but it very much seems that they have a a choice to make do you have a sense of what the afterlife is like? Like what kind of environment souls are living in? Well, the the ones that are in the oneness, mm-hmm. it's I mean they're in light, right? They're they're living in light particles, so um they're they're in the air. They're yeah. <laughs> they're in the light. Um I You know, I don't know. I I haven't had much experience with the ones in the dark, and um, because I don't really want to. Um, but um, one time, like in a vision, I guess you could call it a vision in meditation, I was taken to the edge of where the dark was, and so this is just my perception of my experience. I I don't claim to know that exactly what it's like or anything but it was dark i mean anything that wasn't light right it was like opposite it was dark and it was cold i mean i got physically cold mm. and it it stunk it was it wasn't pleasant at all mm. and, and i wasn't in it i was on the edge like Yeah. Yeah, in uh, shamanism, you know, um traditionally there's also the belief in different realms and um and and the different realms are uh different because of the frequency. So some le- some levels are more are just more dense and that could feel like darkness. Um, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah or something more heavy <clears throat> um i think traditionally they don't believe that it is uh necessarily bad good or bad you know like in yeah. <clears throat> like in christian uh belief they think you know it's either good or bad but right. here is more just different types of energy and and it could be um like say <laughs> it's the same way with e- emotions all our emotions are good right they all help us determine um how we feel about something or how we're reacting to something so that we can make a decision for ourselves right those yeah. that's our emotions so you can't say that any of them are bad we we develop from early ages or from conception probably we uh develop our stories around which frequency that is called sad is bad or if it's the frequency that is thick of uh fear is bad 
And so they're, they're uh, perhaps lower or thicker, um, denser frequencies, like you were saying, and, and not good or bad. Yeah, it's, it's possible, uh, like, um, like our emotions are. Yeah, I, I do not know. Um, and, but um, none of the, none of the frequencies are bad, you know, if they were, because they're frequencies that exist in nature. It's, um, and so, like, our goal shouldn't be to raise our vibration, because all vibrations would be good, because they were, they exist, so they're good. It's um, raising our voltage, I guess, because we are batteries that connect heavens, the, the heavens above with the earth below, right? Did you say batteries? Batteries. We're yeah. batteries. Okay. <laughs> that we, we become charged, recharged by them, and we release charge to them. And mm -hmm. so we're, we're like, we all operate as a system, the electric universe system. Yeah. yeah. And so how do you see uh, our current challenges right now with, um, um, with the, the COVID-19 crisis and all the, the issues that come from that? Um, where are we as humans in this and, 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 and how do we go forward with the frequencies that we're experiencing? Well, it certainly is challenging. Um, the, I think the, to, if people can grasp the electric universe and grass that we all came and we all are all our molecules are still one with the universe with source with that it's just that we when we become in our human body and our through our lives we become so we're not aware of it anymore right and so but we all um, exist on that level first before we're in our bodies and um, so I think if we can grasp that we're part of the universe and because we're part of everything, it's not like the individual people are doing things for our good, but the universe is for our good. It, it's always want, has our best in mind. And we interpret the things that bring to us as good or bad the more we interpret the things that come as all good for us, then the more love and feelings of being loved we um, radiate from our body and that causes more good to come in, right? When we're feeling heavy, when we're feeling um, sad or negative or or discouraged or, or doubtful or fearful or thinking things are against us, more of those things, more of those um, darker or, or fear or sadder or things like doubtful things happen or come into our lives that continue what we think. So the, the more we can realize the goodness of everything working for our favor and learn to receive as that, then, then we attract more of that into our lives. And um, so we all, in the, in the situation today, the more that more of us can be striving to live in that mindset, the better we'll all be. Hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, the the universe is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah, definitely. In, in, incredible. Yeah.
It's incredible. Yeah, so the challenges we're facing are also gifts. You know, they're helping us. Well, they are. Well, just, yes, just think um, all the, say, like, um, I, I've been, have worked some, say, like, oh, what's a real good example? Things that happen to us, say, like, um, well, it's an uh, easy one for me anyway. Um, I was an untimely pre pregnancy, right? My mother and father weren't ready to be pregnant again. They had one. They wanted more children, but I was too soon, right? And so there was resistance, right? Well, as a embryo, I didn't feel safe then, right? Because... Um, of that uncertainty or whatever it was that frequency and so then even though I was loved and cared for and very much wanted all my life it was those first um days or weeks or months of um uncertainty that um probably flipped the switches in my DNA so that I also accumulated then all the ancestors junk that had all those uncertainties mm. too. So then I come into this world as a person filled with fear and filled with unworthiness and from the get go. Right. And so um, now I lost my train of thought. The um, if you, all the things that happen to us, if you take from that, if, if there's, um, um, molestation, um, if there is um, people being mean to you, if there's um, divorce, and I mean, and I've had a, a, a scat of stuff in my history, right? And so it's like, um, you can look at all those from the victim standpoint of, they did this to me, right? And I'm making the best of it. Well, you can look at it worse. You can look at it as I'm, you know, it's all bad. And there's nothing I can do about it. And then there's, well, it wasn't good, but I'm making the best of it. And then you can look at it as it was good for me. Not that I would have wanted all those individual things to happen, but if those individual things had not happened as they did by the people they did, I would not be who I am now. I would not be loving and expanding and growing and radiating the love of the universe, right? And I mean, that sounds kind of out there for a lot of people. And I would have thought that was really out there not too that, not too awfully long ago in my past, right? I thought, I was like, well, oh, she's crazy, right? Or, <laughs> or that's good for her. She might believe it, but I sure don't see it that way. But, um, but it's like, if you consider that each of our molecules before we existed as a person, right? Not even as a body. Before we existed as an individual spirit, right? All our molecules, energy just exists, right? Light just exists. You can't make it and you can't do away with it. It can change a little and change where it's used or the shape it's in or condensed to or whatever, but you can't like get rid of energy, right? It just uh, changes. And so if you consider that each of our individual molecules of our body and our energy being were part of the ether, right, in the electric universe, and then when it was time, all those particles came together as me or you, then each of those molecules know intimately the oneness they are still 
part of the oneness. They're just in a different form. And they want me or themselves, I guess, as my individual being, they want me to know that I'm part of the oneness, just like each molecule in itself knows that it's part of the oneness. They want my mind to know that I'm part of the oneness, right? Mm -hmm. So if we, can ex if we can accept that each of those molecules all through our lives are holding that big desire, right? Of wanting to know the oneness, then with that desire in the world of intentions and the electric universe, it's drawing into us the energies that are going to come to cause us or help us shape us so that we can eventually see our oneness with our mind. Right? Mm -hmm. And so if you see it that way, that all our molecules all our lives are always working for our good. I mean, it, I didn't love myself before, right? And uh, as soon as I realized that each of my molecules are always, always have been drawing things in because of my or their innate overwhelming desire to realize the oneness right then oh, i am so filled with gratitude for myself right mm -hmm. so you can look at say the parents or the brother or the sister or the aunt or the uncle or the boss or all these the ex-husband or whatever you can look at all these and say it was bad or they were bad to me or you can look at it as my molecules loved me so much that they emitted the frequency that drew in the frequency of these other things so that I can know the oneness as they know the oneness hmm. and to, to me that is so incredibly um overwhelmingly awesome yes that is magical it's magical <laughs> yeah, it's magical was there a, a specific event in your life that that made you come to this realization um well i had gotten to a place where I was always, I guess, living from the perspective of, well, those things happen to me, but I'm going to make the best of them if it kills me, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so that's uh, basically probably how I lived my life, uh, you know, making uh, lemonade out of lemons as much as possible until I reached this point and it didn't work anymore. No matter what I tried, no matter what I did, I couldn't do it anymore. And I told my husband, I said, it's not working. I can't do it. And he says, I can tell it's not. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were, uh, I guess, trying to experiment. It was something drawn into us. <laughs> We were living off grid. We were building a homestead from scratch on a shoestring budget, right? And we were paying everything for cash, with cash, and bought the land with cash. So we were only doing it as we could. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll be 60 in a couple months, right? And so it's like we found out, oh, well, we're almost too old for this because it's a lot harder physically than we realized it would be, right? Mm -hmm. And, oh, we need a heck of a lot more money than what we had <laughs> to, to set it all up. Once you have everything set up, then you could maintain with not a whole, if everything's 
you don't need much cash. If you grow your own food and you sell a few things and all that, you know, you don't need a whole lot of cash. But to get to that point where you can provide everything you need, it takes a lot of cash. And we were doing it from scratch, right? And so it was, it was very hard. And I was further away from my children than I wanted to be. And um, all our money were go was going into the homestead so we could survive um, through the winter or, you know, whatever. And so it was too much. And so all these ways, all these patterns that I'd had used for my whole life, uh, work, 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 because, you know, work is good for you. You can make a lot of advancement in life through, you know, you work hard and you make progress and you get places, right? And you earn respect and you respect yourself, you know, the, and which, which is, you know, there's a lot of good to that, but it was like, it didn't work. It didn't work for me. My, you know, I was like, um, I was, I, my, it was too much. And, um, and so anyway, so my husband says, okay, I can tell it's not working. I'll move anywhere you think you'll be happy. And so we moved to where I knew I would be happy and which was close to one of my children, right? And because I didn't, my other one lives in a city and I didn't want to live in a city. <laughs> and so um, live um, where I knew I'd be happy. And then, and then I knew I needed a new career because the last career I'd had it left a terrible bad taste in my mouth. It, I mean, it was extremely difficult and um, it put, it put, it was, there was so much stress. It put my mind in a place where my mind wasn't working right anymore. Mm. And so I had quit that and let my licenses go. So I didn't, would never return to that again. And so then, so I'd been doing house cleaning and gardening for elderly people, which was a wonderful thing to do. It was very hard work. And so I knew getting older, I'd need something different. And I wanted something that was me, you know, I could put my soul in. And mm. so I found the electric universe. And um, that's how I'm here. Wow. Beautiful. <laughs> but you so you still live in the countryside, but you don't so you don't have crops or animals now or? We live in a tiny, tiny little town, population 150. And um, the nearest other town with a doctor in it or, you know, a, a store is like um, 10, 15 miles away. Anything that you want more than that, more than one store, basically, and more than one doctor, you know, you have to go about 40 miles. <laughs> I love it. You know, it's, I grew up in rural. I like rural. It's small, it's quiet. Right. And so we, my husband and I garden extensively. We have, um, we have about half an acre and um, we're working on, um, we haven't lived in this house all that long, a year is all. And so um, we're still building up you know, our, our gardening space. And I, I like to grow herbs and make herbal medicines like salves and tinctures and things. And I love flowers. And, um, so we're still working on, um, setting up things the way we want. But, um, <clears throat> Are you I, planning on getting, uh, chickens or ducks or anything like that? Um, yeah, I think not ducks, probably, um, probably chickens, but also quail. Um, quail because, um, they've been, I wouldn't say hybridized. They've been so, um, raised for centuries, basically, um, uh, was it Chinese, Chinese or in some country in, um, in that area. Um, they have bred quail so that they're not wild hardly at all anymore. They all just like cluster together. Oh. And so you, even if you had a, a big, um, an acre they could run in, they don't. They huddle together. And so they're raised in 
cages, basically. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I mean, they're, you treat them well. It's just, they wouldn't do it and they wouldn't run in nature anyway. They, all they would do is just sit there and huddle. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you just treat them well and feed them well. And, um, they have little eggs, you know, they're small. I don't know how big their eggs are. Top of my finger, maybe a little bigger than that. Yeah. Probably about the top of my thumb. And so it's like, it probably takes three quail eggs to make a chicken egg, but it's, um, but you can keep them indoors and um, that way they're, they're more protected from the winter and they'll lay their eggs through the winter and things like that. Whereas chickens, a lot of them um, reduce their laying either in the winter or in the summer based on the type of chicken and the weather that you're having and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah. So but they don't need to get uh, sunlight? Um, uh, light, but they, they don't need the sunlight. At least a lot of people raise them that way. And so I don't know, we haven't made our, you know, final decision on it and haven't, um, it's been a couple of years now since we looked closely into that. And, um, so I, I'm sure I'm forgetting a lot of details and people will know, people that hear this will know and say, <laughs> <laughs> well say that um she doesn't know what she's talking about and and a lot of the details yeah i don't remember what i'm talking about so i'm just putting that. But, i think there are very few people listening to this podcast who would know about how to raise quails <laughs> <laughs> so so anyway but that's and their their lifespan is pretty short oh, but it's okay. like they um they start laying eggs in 10 weeks, whereas chickens lay eggs starting about at 10 months. And then quail only live for two years, I believe, about mm -hmm. there. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a lot shorter lifespan. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the reason I was asking about duck as well is because it's uh, my favorite uh, <laughs> my favorite thing to eat. In Denmark, we get oh, it for okay. Christmas every year. <laughs> Um, but, um, and I, I really love, um, duck and chicken and turkey. Um, and I think if I, if I was living on the, con in the countryside, I would like to have, um, uh, to raise them. Um, also because it's, it's almost impossible to get, um, for instance, chickens that have been fed, uh, something other than soy and corn. Oh, which right. is also negatively affecting your health when you're Absolutely. then eating that. So yeah. um, that would probably be something I would uh, get if I were to move to the countryside. Not sure my husband is into that, but <laughs> maybe someday. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and yeah, if you can raise your own um, food to feed the chicken, even, or the, the quail, either one. And yeah. yeah, if you had space for them and, could have the good organic um, things to feed them and yeah things. yeah then you then you have a lot of health there so that's great yeah definitely well before we wrap up and um and you tell people where they can find you or and if you have any closing thoughts i was wondering if you could um take uh, the the tuning forks and just do uh, a little uh just show people what, what is the sound of the different ones you have close to you oh, right now. Sure. I don't have very many right here. Um, I can grab another one real quick. This is this is an unweighted fork. It's like one of the, it is the smallest one I have. It's a 528 hertz. Um, 528 hertz. And this is on the um, Schumann residence, I believe. I... Um, I might be pulling, uh, remembering that wrong. But anyway, um, the 528 hertz is thought to be the frequency of love. Mm -hmm. It's thought to be the frequency of DNA repair. And I use this one a lot, especially in the second biofield for um, ancestors, um, because it's all about love that you're showing them and and recognizing their life and it has a a nice little tone to it and there we go um 
I also use, I don't, I only grabbed a couple here to have with me. Now the, the weighted forks, I was gonna see, here I have a, you don't hit those on a hockey puck. Um, some weighted forks, you can use the palm of your hand, but um, these are recommended to use like a um, striker pad of some kind, or I use a hiking boot heel. <laughs> <laughs> and so you don't hear it. You can hear a vibration if you're close enough to it, but you don't hear it. You okay. feel it. It's stronger. Uh, you know, you, you feel the stronger resonance. Hmm. Um, then... The, the weighted forks you can use on your body. Here's another weighted fork. Um, but again, it doesn't make a noise either. It's just okay. quiet. Um, but yeah, I often use a, a 174 hertz. And um, there's a, I also have a, another one, a 417 hertz one. And the, the forks I use are sold by Eileen McCusick at biofieldtuning.com. They're uh, very high quality and they're made in the United States. And um, so they give you a real true tone and a true resonance and last a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but, so, yeah. And any closing thoughts? Um, no, I just uh, wish everybody well and encourage everyone to, um, uh, especially with all these, the turmoil in the the world today, then um, uh, one of the best things you can do is to take time every day, 20 minutes if possible, and um, get quiet inside, um, call it meditation, call it activation, call it breathing call it yoga, you know, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to call it. Um, get quiet inside yourself, connect to source. And you'll not just survive and not just make lemonade out of lemons, but you can thrive in what um, is brought to you. Wonderful. And where can people find you if they want to uh, book a session with you or if they want to just reach out and ask you something sure yeah yeah questions are fine too the um uh, my website is ancestralriver.com it's spelled a-n-c-e-s-t-r-a-l river.com and um if they sign up for a um uh, sign up their email um, I'll send you a, a free recording of a grounding, a biofield grounding session, so you can kind of get an idea what it's like. If you want to ask me questions or are interested in a session or whatever, you use the contact page. And um, it's just me, so you'll hear from me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Carl. I really appreciated you coming on the Nordic Magic Link podcast and telling uh, your story and, uh, and about your craft. Well, thank you, Emma. Thank you so much. It's been so good to see you again. And um, Likewise. Um, I just wish everybody well and, and Godspeed. <laughs>